مولانا مولانا يا سامع دعانا بحرمة محمد والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفاء اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد نورك الساري ومددك الجاري واجمعني به في كل أطواري وعلى آله وصحبه يا نور وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين and we ask Allah that these prayers and peace that we've sent this salah and the salam that we sent on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions and family that they be upon us with that group and among that group that we be with them and among them and we ask you that O oh Allah by your mercy and you're the most merciful of the merciful Ya Arham Ar Rahimin, Ya Arham Ar Rahimin, Ya Arham Ar Rahimin. Alhamdulillah, Allah said of His Habib, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Alaihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam, Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. We didn't send you except as a mercy to all the worlds. And from the meanings of Al Alamun, of Al Alameen is those that have a spirit from among the creation. Because the Alam is everything other than Allah. So specifically, mankind, jinn, and the angels. He's a mercy to all of those. And he said of himself, Inna ma'ana rahmatun muhda. Surely I am only a gift of mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is in a hadith Qudsi that is sahih that after Allah created the creation, he brought forth from beneath the throne a parchment, a scroll upon which is written, Rahmati sabaqat ghadabi, that my mercy outstrips my wrath. And he is a mercy, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, that outstrips Allah's wrath, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he'll be the one when Allah manifests, manifests in an anger that prior to the day of judgment, he will not have manifested himself. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the one that can stand and say, Ana laha, I am for this. I am for this and prostrate and intercede, not just for us, not just for all of mankind, for all of mankind, as well as the jinn, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, believers and unbelievers, and that's his greatest intercession, faslul qada, faslul qada, right, for the, the judgment to commence, when everyone is in a perilous condition, to whom must humanity flee? To al-habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nabiya rahmah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, and this gathering, and we ask Allah to accept it. We ask Allah that it be blessed, and this is a blessed night. This is a blessed night and it's Laylatul Jumu'ah. It's the eve, it's Juma's eve, right? We have some brothers, uh, we have an argument in the United States whether we celebrate the, the holiday that they call Thanksgiving or not. One of the brothers, they came and said, I'm gonna divide, I'm gonna settle that dispute. I'm celebrating Juma's eve, because it always happens on a Thursday. Juma's eve is a very blessed night. Juma's eve is a night where there is a unique or a heightened connection to Al-Habib sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam as there is on the day of Friday, right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, أَكْثِرُ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَيْ فِي اللَّيْلَةِ الزَّهْرَى وَالْيَوْمِ الْأَزْهَرْ فَإِنَّ صَلَاتَكُمْ تُعْرَضُ عَلَيْهِ Send many prayers, send much salawat upon me in the radiant night, which is this night, Thursday, Juma's Eve, and Friday, the bright day, Friday, for why? Why does he say? For your prayers are shown to me. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we want to call to heart this meaning that these salawat that we've been sending in this gathering from the very beginning when, when uh, Sidi Nada, our beloved uh, reminder of Allah, and that's what a munshid is. He said, this isn't show business, this is tadkir billah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa bi rasulihi. Right, he reminded us of Allah and his messenger and it's in salawat of the messenger as long as we're sending salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, our salawat are being shown to him. He says of Friday specifically that while as long as someone is sending salat upon him, that person is being shown to him until that person finishes. And alhamdulillah wa shukrullah ala dhalik. Wa salatullahi wa salamuhu alayka ya Sayyidina ya Rasulullah. And we ask Allah to accept these salawat and that he present them to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that the, he please the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with us in the manner in which we're, the state in which we're in when he presents them to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
And then there's another unique manifestation of divine grace that occurs on Juma's Eve. And throughout most of the year, we know in a number of Sahih Hadith, some of them Qudsi, that in the last third of the night, Allah says, who is there with a need that I may fulfill it? Who is praying that I may answer it? Who is seeking forgiveness that I may forgive them? Who is turning in repentance that I may accept their repentance, right? That's in the, the last third of the night through most of the year. However, there are unique special nights in the year, like Thursday night when this is from Maghrib. So we're in a gathering where every time you say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's being shown in, to Al-Habib Sallallahu Where if we ask Allah for paradise, Allahumma inna nasaluka, ridaka wal jannah, right? Allah is saying to us, who has a prayer that I may fulfill it? If you've come with the burdens, or I've come, we've come with our burdens of sins that are weighing down our backs and we ask Allah to forgive us, Allah is offering himself to us, saying, who is seeking forgiveness that I may forgive them? And we ask Allah to forgive us, the members of our households, our spouses, our children, our parents, and all believing men and women. We ask Allah to accept this by Allah's mercy, and Allah is the most merciful of the merciful. So alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah ala dhalik. And this is a tour of virtues, and may Allah guide us to virtues. And understand that a great door to virtue for each of us is salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. He said in a hadith that is Hassan, narrated by Tirmidhi, Awlan nas bi yawm al qiyamah aktharahum alayhi salah. The closest or most deserving of my patronage on the day of resurrection are of humanity, from among humanity, are those who sent the most prayers upon me. And he says in another hadith of Imam Tirmidhi, that's also Hassan, إِنَّ مِنْ أَحَبِّكُمْ إِلَيَّ وَأَقْرَبَكُمْ مِنِّي مَجْلِسًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَحَاسُنُكُمْ خُلُقًا Right, he said, surely from the most beloved, the most dear of you to me, and the one whose seat, right, a seat, your chair, your seat, your sitting place on Yom Qiyamah is closest to me, he says. Who's saying this? Al Habib Sallallahu The one who is most dear to me and whose seat is closest to me on the day of resurrection is, are those of you who have the best character. So if he said the one who sits closest to him is the one with the best character, and if he said the one who sends the most salawat upon him is the one who is closest to him, that one who's closest will only be one. So the one who sends the most salawat on the Prophet Wasallam, that will be the one with the best character, and may Allah bring us near him. Near him in our character, near him in our behavior, near him in our statements, and our words and deeds, and near his mercy, and may Allah make us a mercy to all of the worlds. And Sheikh Ibrahim, Hafidhullah, he mentioned something that taught us a lesson, and from that we drew another analogy. And it connects to uh, what we'll mention, however it's fast forwarding in his seerah to eight years after his migration in Ramadan during the opening of Mecca, Fat Mecca. So Sheikh Ibrahim mentioned to us that Uthman bin Talha, who was whose tribe were the custodians of the key to the Kaaba and was one of the tribes that were adversarial to the tribe of, of the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Banu Hashim that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he prevented him from entering the Kaaba he smiled at him and may Allah give us to see the smiling face of Al-Habib Sallallahu May Allah smile on us in this world, smile on us in our dreams, may He smile on us in this world, smile on us in our dreams, smile on us at the time of death, in Khairun Lutfan Afiyah, in the Barzakh, Yom Al Qiyamah, and in Jannah, in Afiyah. So the Prophet was, was forbearing, and he said, maybe you'll see this key one day in my hand, and I'll give it to whomever I wish, and he didn't take it for his own tribe. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, though he could have. Also, during that opening, he stood on the door of the Kaaba, and this was the Mecca that we'll, we'll study in a moment. This was, the, 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 these were the, the dwellers of Mecca, who as we've seen in this verse used, martyred Sayyidina Sumeya, tortured the rest of her family and martyred them, martyred Sayyidina Bilal, uh, tortured Sayyidina Bilal, tortured Khabbab, 
as we'll see the ones who assaulted him and insulted him. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. However, they knew him. So he stood on the door and he said, what? To the Kaaba, he said, what do you think I'll do with you? And they said, khayr. Akhun Karim. Right? For those that were Hashemi, he's their brother. Those that were the adversaries of his grandfather Hashem, what did they say? Wabnu Akhin Karim. And a noble cousin. Despite all of their persecution and their transgression, what did they expect from the Prophet of Mercy? Anything other than good. Whether they were his own clansmen or those clans that had, uh, uh, had shown enmity to him, to him and his, and, and his, and his, uh, and his tribe. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So what did he say? He said, Idhabu fa antum tulaqa. He said, Go when you're all free. And Ali Imam Ghazali says that they left the masjid as if being, and this was, they were on kufr at this point, many of them. They left the masjid as if being resurrected by the, from the grave and they entered Islam in multitudes. So that is Nabi Rahmah. And I preface what I have to say by that so that you do not understand that the, 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 the default in our case is ever vengeance. Or the default in our religion and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that the primary go-to is vengeance or violence or, or wrath or anything, any of those things. But rather, the default and the thread through the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, through the facets of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu is Rahmah. Right? وَرَحْمَةِ صَبَقَتْ غَضَبِ Allah says. And he's a manifestation of Allah's attributes. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Wasallam. However, when he openly proclaimed his da'wah, at first they didn't persecute him, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Sallam. However, when he began to criticize their idols, they began to directly persecute him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he would remind them that their idols were just stones that could not speak and could not benefit and could not harm. Right? And he reminded them of the absurdity of their idolatry. They're worshiping idols and then they intensified their, their, uh, their, vin their uh, enmity towards him and physically persecuted him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And many times when we study his seerah, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam, we study the persecution particularly, and when I'm talking about I'm talking about violent persecution. The violence against the likes of Sayyidina Sumayyah, and the likes of Sayyidina Bilal, and the likes of Sayyidina Khabbab radiallahu anhum wa ardahum. However, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam, he was physically assaulted throughout the message. From those early days in Mecca, well into al Medina, and ultimately he passed on, as he said, إلى الرفيق الأعلى, to the highest company, as a martyr from the poisoning that occurred from after the battle of Khaybar. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he himself was physically assaulted and persecuted in those days of Mecca. The scholars of Sirah narrate, that once he was stoned and he was bloodied outside of Mecca and Sayyidina Jibril came to him and comforted him. They narrate the Uqbah bin Abi Mu'ayt that the Prophet ﷺ was prostrated at the Kaaba and that he stepped on the neck of the Prophet ﷺ. They narrate that he wrapped a, a, uh, a cloth around the Prophet ﷺ and strangled the Prophet ﷺ until his eyes bulged out. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr came and defended him. And they narrate, and we want to look at this narration, because it's a narration that in, in respects is an exception to the general rule that we find of his praying for his adversaries rather than against them. And this is a narration of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, and again this occurs in the Meccan period, and this is um, narrated on the authority of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was standing and praying at the Kaaba. So this is who? This is Allah's Messenger. Standing where? In Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Doing Salah at the Kaaba, the house of his Lord Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and the group of Quraysh were sitting in their gatherings. So in the narration of Al-Bukhari, he says that one of them said, and that one is Abu Jahl, that Abu Jahl says to them, 
Look at this show off. Unzur ila ha'ala tanzuruna ila hadha al-mura'i wa li hadha billah ta'ala. Don't you see this one committing riyah, this one who's showing off? Which of you will go to the slaughtered camel of al so and so? And that's Jummah, right? The tribe of Jummah. Which of you will go to the slaughtered camel and take its dung and take its blood and take its guts and wait until he's prostrate and put it on his back? So that uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, he says, so the most wretched of them went. The most wretched of them is Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt. And as Sheikh Ibrahim mentioned, some of these adversarial relationships, they were the caprice, they were the hawa, and the hawa, it'll destroy a human being. These were the adversary, these were the, the enmity that lasted between various tribes and the tribe of his great grandfather, Hashem. And this particular individual is from Bani Umayyah, Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt, who in this hadith is Ashqahum. So the most wretched of them went, right? And he took, you know, the innards. Anyone, any of us that, uh, that, that, you know, slaughter animals, or I was telling the brothers, you know, when you're hunting, you don't want to shoot the animal in its guts because it's gross, right? There's guts, and you know, he popped the guts. And his, he went and took that, and while Allah's messenger, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is prostrate directly before the Kaaba, right, in the most sacred of our masajid, the first house that was placed for humanity to worship Allah, he's prostrate there, and this sick individual takes the innards of this slaughtered camel and places them between the shoulders of Allah's messenger while he's prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the narration says, فَثَبَتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ Right, so Allah's messenger remained steadfast. And then someone goes and they tell Sayyidatina Fatima Zahra, right, who's just a little girl, that this has happened to your father. So Sayyidatina Fatima comes running and she removes it from his back. And then she faces these, these, again, leaders of disbelief, right? Leaders of tyranny and she begins cursing them. Sabbahum shatamatum, sabbatum shatamatum. She begins cursing them. Radiallahu anha wa ardaha. And then the Prophet ﷺ finishes his prayer. The narrator says, actually, excuse me, before that, the narrator says that as they're doing this, they begin to fall over one another laughing at the spectacle that they've just, uh, that they've just created. Of, of the Prophet ﷺ prostrate with these innards on his back, they're falling over themselves laughing. So then he finishes his prayer, and then he says, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh. He says it thrice. And Sheikh Ibrahim said, when Muhammad Sallallahu smiles, that is a good thing. And when Muhammad Sallallahu is angry, that is not good. Yani. That is not good. And we seek refuge in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from, uh, other than the Prophet Sallallahu smiling upon us. So he says, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh. Oh, Allah sees Quraysh, right? He's making dua against them. In the narration of Muslim, he says, when he begins praying against them, they stop laughing. And there's a point about these individuals, they knew he was truthful. <coughs> Abu Jahl, he knew the Prophet Sallallahu was on the truth. However, he denied it because what? They were contending parties. They were contending tribes. If the Prophet Sallallahu tribe would feed the pilgrims, they would compete with them in food, and so on. If the Prophet Sallallahu tribe has a prophet, the last prophet, where are they going to find a prophet? It was, it was entirely capricious, his, his kufr. And that's kufr, right? What is kufr? Kufr is to, is to deny the truth. They willingly denied the truth of the Al-Habib Sallallahu As we saw Ubay bin Kaab, he said he's never told a lie. So he feared the conflict with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or, or the, the blow of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who, when he said he was going to kill him because he knew Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wasn't lying. They did this knowing he was lying, that, that, knowing that he was truthful. So he says, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh. And then he begins to list names. And he says, Allahumma alayka bi Amr ibn Hisham. That's Abu Jahl. Wa Utbah bin, bin, bin Rabi'ah. 
wa Shayba bin Rabia wa Walid bin Utba wa Umayya bin Khalaf wa Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt wa Umara bin Al-Walid he's, he's saying oh Allah see so and so see so and so see so. and at this point they're not laughing right at that that's that yani that is that and then um Sayyidina Ibn uh, Ibn Mas'ud he says I swear by Allah I saw all of them uh, killed at the Battle of Badr. And what is the Battle of Badr? Yom al-Furqan. Right? The Battle of Badr, one of the things you could see it is the conflict between truth and, and falsehood. Another way you can understand it is the conflict between materialists and those who gain their support from Allah alone. 300, they, we say 313, it's actually 305. Eight of them were not present, but they were counted among those present. A few horses, a few camels, not even all of them armed. But Allah defeated the people of falsehood. And these are imams of falsehood. And he said, I saw all of them cast into the well of Bedr. And then he says, the messenger of Allah, then the messenger of Allah said, وَأُتْبِعُوا أَصْحَابُ الْقَلِيب لعنة. And, and curse, may curse for, pursue or may curse be the ultimate outcome of, of the people of this well. Ibn, uh, Ibn Hajar, he says that it's possible that this dua occurred back in those days of Mecca and then it would be one of the signs of prophecy, right? That these would eventually be from the people of the well. That's in what? Like around the, before the fifth year, right? That's in these early years. Eight years later, they'll have that conflict, but he's making this dua that these individuals will eventually be the people of the well. Even in this, brothers and sisters, though, there's a mercy. And there's a point I want to make here. And I'm speaking to all of you, but especially I'm speaking to the brothers. You know, one of the things with us constantly being accused of being terrorists, constantly being accused of being, of, of being violent, you even have those that say we shouldn't study the conflicts, the battles of the Prophet ﷺ in the seerah. You know, you have, it's as if you have to only be soft and beautiful. And the Prophet ﷺ was always soft and beautiful. But we find the Prophet ﷺ, you might make him angry for Allah's sake. And when he would become angry, no one could withstand his anger. So in this case, this is something that warranted anger, and the Prophet ﷺ responded accordingly. On the day of the battle of Uhud, when his, his beloved uncle was martyred, that war and, and mutilated that warranted anger, and the Prophet ﷺ showed uh, immense anger. Right? However, Allah revealed to him to pardon, and he pardoned. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in this case, we see this is an example, and this is al-Bukhari and Muslim narrating this. This is an example that is an exception to the general rule that we see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi always praying for his adversaries rather than against them. This is an, an example where he plays specifically against them and names specific adversaries. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So when we had the opportunity to read this chapter of the seerah in our days at Dara Mustafa, we passed that question. What is this, the difference in this circumstance when he prayed against these enemies and the, the many, many circumstances, which again we began with, and that's the general rule when he would pray for his adversaries. And the answer that our, our Shaykh al-Habib Omar gave us was that the, the people of a prophet reaching the pinnacle of arrogance and audacity towards Allah may mandate that a prophet pray against them out of servitude to Allah. Right? Bulug, qawm, nabi, timmat at tatawul wal jara'a ala Allah qad yaqtadi da'wat al nabi alayhim. However, even in this dua against them, and again, we cannot like that, Yani. And, but if we don't like that, I hope it's not that we don't like that. And I'm, I have to just speak straight because we're going to upset the English. If I was back home, I'd say, I hope it's not like that because we're going to accept Trump and his crew. I hope we're not disliking to hear force and strength on the part of our, our, our brothers and our prophet because we're afraid of how the non-Muslims whose acceptance we're seeking are going to perceive us. Because they celebrate their battles. And they boast about it, right? The sun never set on the British Empire. Yeah, how did the British Empire come? In my country, the person on the $20 bill, the $5 bill, the Native Americans deem him to be their Hitler. So I'm going to apologize because one time my prophet Salaam, prayed against his enemies rather than for them. When you annihilate a nation of people and you're not, and you're not, you're not ashamed to admit it, 
So I hope that that's not the reason we wouldn't incline to that, but generally, absolutely, Rahmah. However, even in this, and I didn't finish the answer, our Shaykh taught us that there's a Rahmah from him. He says, and this dua of his against these adversaries, and we also find him doing so uh, for the people of Bi'r Ma'una, right, who killed a, a whole group of Quran, of Quran reciters that were sent to them. He prayed against the killers of, the, of this, those Qura at Bi'r Ma'una. He prayed against them for 30 mornings, said it's an Aisha narrates in the Sahih. Why at times would he pray against adversaries and other times, and as generally he would pray for them, Again, if it's just so audacious, it mandates that, right? Out of, out of servitude to Allah, this is what Allah has shown you. The warranted response is that, and that's how he responded, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, even in that, right? Even in that, from him, his praying against them is a subtle mercy. How is that a subtle mercy? Because someone who is oppressed, if they pray against their oppressor, that actually decreases the punishment of the one who oppressed them on Yom al -Qiyamah. Understand that. And understand the, 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 the firmness and the precision of those ulama, and that, I say this to the, all of you, anyone who's been oppressed and wrong, but especially the brothers, right? Because we'll have that anger that'll come. Right? And, and we want to do something. Like they killed those kids in North Carolina a few years ago. One of our young brothers said, man, what is the response? We want to do something. But understand that if the ulama are telling you to be patient, telling you to be merciful, telling you to have good character, telling you to pray for your adversaries, that in that actually, if were you to take revenge, you would actually reduce their requital on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Right? And the Prophet Sallallahu he said that in the hadith of, of, of At-Tirmidhi, dua that when someone who's oppressed has prayed against his oppressor, they've come to their own defense. They've taken revenge. And what does that do? Because revenge took place in this world, it reduces their accountability on Yom al -Qiyamah. So even in his doing this, in this circumstance, and this is one of the few circumstances, you'll find a few circumstances, you might count them on, on your fingers, where he prays against his adversaries, even that from him is a subtle mercy. It reduces their accountability on Yom Al-Qiyamah, and he is a mercy to all of the world, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us to follow him وسلم, with insight and adhere to his character and follow his sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and we ask Allah by this mercy to the worlds and he is the mercy to all of the worlds he emerged in his light and his radiance and his beauty in this world in, in the likes of this month in body and form and in the likes of this month he passed on to the highest company and this is Layla Tel Juma. he's been shown our salawat upon him salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi so we ask Allah by the right of this Habib Sallallahu and by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's mercy and Allah's names and Allah's attributes and Allah's love for that Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam, we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to open for us gates of mercy from Him Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that all of those who are present, Allah forgive our needs. And He's saying, who has a need that I may forgive it in the likes of this night? We ask you, O oh Allah, to forgive all, fulfill all of our needs on all of those needs who are, of those who are present and those who are in our homes and our loved ones in the community of Nabi Muhammad. We ask you, O oh Allah, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen, we ask you to forgive of our sins. We've committed many sins, brothers and sisters, and what do you, how do we understand it? a a sin? Understand it as an, a departure from the way of the Nabi Muhammad. That one who prostrated there at Allah's house and had the innards of a camel thrown on him, was choked, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, had to watch his companions mutilated, martyred, roasted, tortured on those sands of Arabia, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was driven from his home, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prayed for our forgiveness every night. When we disobey Allah, what are we doing? We're departing from his way, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his tongue, his merciful tongue, his tongue, and he called himself the Nabi at Tawbah, the, the prophet of repentance. His tongue guided us to the fact that Allah forgives us our sins and offers us that our sins be forgiven in the likes of this night and in the likes of these gatherings. He taught us that those who come together to remember Allah solely for Allah, a caller says, and kumu maghfuran lakum. Qad buddilat sayyatukum hasana. Ya Allah, we ask you that. 
by the haq of al habib sallallahu and his truth wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa alihi wa sallam walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin and please excuse me